Hi there, folks. Uh, my name's Scott Blair. I am from the Edinburgh National Festival here at The Hub, and I'm very nice to welcome you all here for this public meeting. Um, just some kind of housekeeping. Uh, we are not expecting any fire alarm, so if there is a fire alarm, it is a real alarm, and you should end, just exit the way you entered the building. Um, and... I'm just trying to think if there is it. Yeah. Uh, bathrooms are just outside the door here or down the stairs. Um, we are recording this, as you can see up here with this camera. If you're not comfortable being on screen, we have some seats at the side which are not in the view of the camera. So you're more than welcome to move there. Um, with that, enjoy your evening and uh, yes, enjoy. Thank you, Scott. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, here and online as well. Thank you for joining us online. Um, my name is Tamara Van Streetem. I'm an Edinburgh resident. Uh, I've been working in the film industry for a long time here in Scotland, and I'm a long-time uh, collaborator of the Film House, and I've been invited to uh, present this evening's conversation with you and, and chair the conversation with you all. And I'd like to start by thanking you, first of all, for being with us um, and thanking, of course, the Edinburgh International Festival for giving us this space to meet. And thank you, Scott, for making that possible. Um, I'm assuming that if you're here tonight, it's because you're all interested in the future of Film House. Um, and the reason why the team that have been working tirelessly to reopen the cinema invited you to join us tonight is because they felt it was an important opportunity for you to hear about the work that's been happening and also an opportunity for you to um, contribute to shaping what comes next. So the um, the evening will be split into two different parts. In the first instance, we'll be hearing from um, the members of that team, three of them, three out of four will be speaking to you. Um, we'll hear from uh, Ginny Atkinson in the first instance, who will update us on the background to the work they've been carrying out, including the legal, the legal framework that they have been working under. Rod White will then uh, outline the programming ethos of Film House um, and what sets a cultural cinema apart from, for example, an independent cinema or an art house cinema. James Rice will provide a summary of the business plan and the operating model that underpin the long-term financial sustainability of Film House. And then Jenny will conclude with an update on the fundraiser. There will then be an opportunity for everyone in the room to ask questions about what has been discussed or maybe seek further clarification. So if a question occurs to you while one of them is speaking, I would ask you to uh, keep that in mind and then we will come to you after these uh, addresses. We have some roving mics, so if you'd like to um, raise your hand when you want to ask a question and we'll come to you. Um, after that, there will then be an opportunity for us to open the floor for more general conversation, perhaps around questions you may have that may not have been addressed earlier. And then we'll invite you to have uh, a chat with each other about, you've seen some prompts maybe when you came in, about the things that you love about Film House and would like to see retained, and then things that you might wish to see improved. Um, so I don't want to take up much more time at all. I'd like us to get started. So I'd like to invite Ginny to get us started. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming, everybody. Um, I feel the need to explain the seating arrangements a little bit because we made a, a we decided that we didn't want to be a them and us situation, like four of us on at the front, and so that's why we are scattered about. But hopefully, the microphones will do their job, and you'll be able to hear everybody. Um, so, my name is Jenny Atkinson, as Tamara said, and um, I'm one of the four. Rod, James, David, um, we're what I would call the operational team in terms of trying to get Film House back. And uh, we also have another board member called Mike Davidson, who is simply a board member. He's not on the operational team, but he's very useful. Um, he's a financial consultant and he knows all sorts of things that we need to know about, uh, like VAT, etc. at some point. So um, I'm going to tell a bit of a story about what happened and how we've got to where we are. So it may, it, it runs the risk of being a bit dum de dum de dum so bear with me. Um, and, and you can ask questions afterwards if I've missed anything out. So when the Centre for the Moving Image went into administration, um, a lot of people were thinking through the kind of shell shock because it was a very shocking thing that happened. Um, you know, what can we do about this? And... 
um, to varying degrees, of course, people were affected by by the this this um, process of the CMI going into administration, um, and it took a time a bit of time for people that had worked there or or very close to it to to you know there were meetings you know big meetings of people saying what you know what can we do, and then. Um, a serendipitous thing happened in that a former colleague of, uh, or somebody who used to work at, at Filmhouse who now lives in Shetland, made one of her visits to Edinburgh and she rings everybody up and says, come to the pub and we'll have a... So, of course, there was a real focus for people <laughs> at that particular, uh, with that particular invitation. And uh, we all ended up talking about what could be done, etc. And um, cutting to the chase... Four of us said, "Okay, let's meet on Monday morning and talk about what we can actually do." Because by then, a couple, uh, at least three weeks had passed, and nothing was happening. <laughs> um, so we were all a bit desperate and post-traumatic. So we met and decided that the best thing we could do was to start a crowdfunder, which Rod had already kind of mapped out. Um, but because there were four of us, we had courage to make it happen, and so. That was crowdfunder number one. One of the things that was quite important to know about that situation was that there was only five weeks before the closing date for the sale of the building. And the building had to be sold because it was an asset. And we're not going to talk too much about what happened to get to that point. But the, the fact is that normally something like that, you might have three months, you know, commercial property, you might have three months five weeks from, and we were already how many weeks into it? Probably about two into the five. So there was three weeks to raise two million pounds, which we thought was the amount that we'd have to bid. So without going into a huge amount of detail about all of that, because already I'm not even past the first paragraph, I'll go a bit faster. Um, what the crowdfunder did was it showed the enormous amount of support and grief that was out there. So that was really useful for um, everybody. Um, we raised an enormous amount of money in a short period of time, but unfortunately it wasn't enough to put a bid in. So all the money went back because it was pledges and using the crowdfunder system is brilliant because they press a button and all the money goes back. So that's what happened. And then um, it was sold to somebody and we couldn't find out who it was. And um, it was a period of great depression around Christmas because we didn't know what to do. We all felt a bit powerless, really. Um, and there were there was a lot of activity going on. I know Screen Scotland uh, were talking to people. Um, there was an individual who continued to be very supportive and thought that he might um, help and try and buy it. If only there was an opportunity to do that. And, and that all went on over the Christmas period and into January. Um, we couldn't find out who it was and what it all meant. But one of the things that uh, was mentioned was that there was a key date, which was the 31st of January. And it turned out that that date was the meeting of the licensing committee uh, for the city council and that the offer for the building had been conditional on an alcohol license being retained in some way. And that did not happen. This is a very, very wonderful thing. <laughs> <laughs> because without that, um, there would now be a pub on Lothian Road called Film House. Ah. So um, we uh, heard that it was the bu the building was up for sale again, as it were, and it's very hard to find out <laughs> what's going on. So in the end, um, okay. So at Christmas, we were all fed up, but we were very determined that there could possibly be a, a film house somewhere. So we were looking at the, the Odeon on Lothian Road, which um, has always been not greatly successful for Odeon. Don't think they would deny that. So uh, we were we talked to Odeon and in the meantime, um, we set up a company called Filmhouse Edinburgh Limited and uh, with a view to somehow recreating Filmhouse in the city, even if it wasn't going to be in the building that we knew. Um, so what next? Um, okay, so the license was refused and that was the pivotal moment. Um, and then we did a lot of delving and asking and research and nosing about and spying and all sorts of things to try and find out what had happened. And then we discovered that Caledonian Heritable had had an offer accepted, which was unconditional. 
Um, so luckily we had their phone number because they had spoken to us further back down the line and we had a meeting with them and at that point it was interesting because we said have you actually signed have you signed for it and they went well no we haven't and we we're going would you consider not signing <laughs> would you consider not buying it um, and they kind of said no we really want to buy it and so that was that uh, because there was somebody else that might have bought it at the time. Um, so we had the meeting and what we realised was that the one chance was to lease the building from them. And luckily, because of the licensing situation in Edinburgh, they were interested in talking about us leasing the building. So that is the journey we're on now. Um, we There's a lot going on at the same time. So the important thing, moving back slightly, is that we needed to be a credible company as cinema operators. And that meant that we needed a business model to show that, contrary to a lot of people uh, thinking that there's a complicated thing, which I'm sure most of you will understand, but the Centre for the Moving Image was a company that that encompassed three organisations, the Film House Cinema, the Film Festival and the Belmont Cinema in Aberdeen. And they lived in the film house building and it was called film house. So when the CMI went uh, into administration, a lot of people thought that the film house cinema had failed, but the cinema was only part of the CMI. And we believe and continue to believe that the cinema is viable. And I think all of you do too. So that's fantastic. Um, so um, James, who's going to talk more about the business angle, um, led a team to do a business model for a new film house. Um, and we applied also for charitable status, which is a very important aspect of this. And we did that in March and we gained that in June. Um, and we were then engaged in the process of thinking about funding and also um, the legal process towards getting a lease. Um, we had great support from Screen Scotland all the way down the line. So thank you to them. And we had support from the City of Edinburgh Council. And I think slowly the, the belief that, that we could run the cinema um, came a bit clearer because we hadn't realised, because we know we could run the cinema because <laughs> that's what we've all done. Um, but I think we suddenly realised a lot of people weren't sure about that. So gradually as we gave people the business model and talked about it to councillors and everybody it became clear that we were a credible force um okay so we got the arrangement that we came to with caledonia inheritable was that we would have a license to occupy for six months which would enable us to raise funds for setting up the business again um, all the legal stuff that's involved, but also refurbishing the cinema, which James will talk a bit more about. Because it is, I mean, now it's dark and miserable, but if you go into Cinema 2, for instance, it's an, it's really pretty bad <laughs> because the seats are, how many years old are the seats? At least 25 years old. Um, and we all know the, the flaws of, 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 of the cinema um, where you can't cross your legs and and you can kind of peel back the fabric on the arms. It's really desirable. Um, you can find the fabric. <laughs> so um, refurbishment is very important. And we have now got this license to occupy, which takes us to the end of February. And what we're doing is we are uh, talking with architects and they're going to supply costs for all the different things that need to be done. And we're fundraising towards a point where we can uh, match the requirement to do the work and all the other costs that need to be covered. And then if we know we've got enough money, we can sign the lease and then we can do the work and then we can open the doors. So that's kind of that bit of the story. There's a couple of observations before I hand over uh, to Rod. Um, Caledonia Inheritable, um, there was a, a kind of outcry when it was found out that they had bought the building because, of course, everybody thought it was going to be a pub. Interestingly, um, they're a big company and they have interests beyond pubs, although they do run pubs. And so they bought the building, and this is just a conjecture, really, 
because they just wanted that great property in the middle of Edinburgh. And I don't think they were particularly sure what they might do with it, but they are a big enough company to kind of get a good asset and, and kind of sit on it for a while. They're doing a huge amount of repair work to the building, which is fantastic because it's now got a proper sealed roof. It's got great drainage um, and they're going to put in new windows at the front, which are triple glazed um, and they've done all the pointing on the masonry, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So that has been a huge advantage because if anyone else had bought the building, they'd have, or we had bought the building, we'd have to have fundraised to do all the repairs. Um, yes, we're having to pay rent if this lease is signed. That is not at all unusual. What was unusual was that Filmhouse used to own the building. Um, and that was a historical advantage of when they were set up. But it, all, I mean, you could think of lots of cultural venues in the city, other cinemas, they pay rent to a landlord. It's not unusual at all. Um, we've had a market rent survey done so that we're not ripped off in the matter of the rent. Um, the equipment in the projection box, uh, Caledonian Heritable are going to gift to us. Um, it's already been used, in fact, for uh, some work during the film festival. They have no desire to run the cafe bar. We will run the cafe bar and that will be part of the charity work. It's a trading company, but it feeds the profits up to the charity. Um, and we're really, we're talking to the architects, like I said, and the amount of money that they have spent on the building is probably about two or three years worth of rent. So it just gives you an idea that it's not such a bad thing in some respects. And we have no choice. If we want Filmhouse back, we need to take out a lease and pay rent. And that's now factored into the business model. So um, I think I've probably said enough. <laughs> and I'll come back to the fundraising afterwards. But thank you for listening to all of this. <laughs> God. I'm going to I'm going to break all the rules and and stand up. Good. I'm like the Sundance kid, you know, unless I'm moving I'm, I can't be that accurate. So, here we go. Um I'm Rod White. I as many of you'll know, well uh, was the programmer at the old film house for more years than I care to mention. Um I'm going to give you just some sort of basic principles of how a cinema like film house works. When I give you the basic principles, I don't mean to suggest in any way that that's the way it always has to stay, um, and anyone has any ideas about other things they could do may well fit into its future. What I'm about to say precludes nothing new happening at all. It's, ju it's just background, really. And Filmus is a cultural cinema. The term cultural cinema is, a, is one that's been arrived at probably in the last decade. There was always terms like art house was the kind of favorite word for a long time. What, is a, what does a cultural cinema actually mean? Well, I got someone smarter than me, James, to <laughs> write a sentence about what that is. So I'm just going to I'm just going to read that. Um, I did embellish it, to be fair to him. So not all of it, not all of it is his fault. <laughs> uh, a cultural cinema champions great filmmaking, past and present, from every filmmaking culture, and creates a space where people are free to explore to their heart's content the language of cinema. And without meaning to go a little bit funding application on you. A wider knowledge of film gives us a wider knowledge and understanding of different cultures and ideas. Cultural cinema does not sit easily within a mainstream or a highly commercialised cinema environment. And as far as Edinburgh is concerned, without, as far as Edinburgh is concerned, it does not exist um, without Filmhouse or an equivalent. Filmhouse, the old Filmhouse, historically showed some 650, between 650 and 850 films per year. Three to four hundred of which, on average, only ever showed uh, in film house as far as the city was concerned. The programme can be seen to sort of fall into four different areas. Uh, one of the really important ones is all the sort of major new releases. Um, in general terms, of those sort of 650 plus films that it might show in a year, um, 30 of those give us about, or gave, sorry, I apologize if I talk in the present tense, and I'm talking about the old film house, but it's, I'll fall into it every now and again, that's for sure. Um, 30 of the films make up about 50% of the box office that comes in. So in terms of the uh, balancing the books, they are 
extremely important parts of the program. A um, couple of films that we that would have shown there, I imagine, would have been Barbie and Oppenheimer. They're definitely major new releases, and from some years ago, Parasite, they would be examples. Um, these films are generally released by US studios or some of the bigger UK distributors. Um, Filmhouse has a historical difficulty with all these films in that some local competition um, went to some lengths to stop Filmhouse showing the films it wanted to show on release. So making that sort of financial balance a little bit more complicated than it is for most other cinemas of its kind in the country. Um, the other sort of second part of the, of the program is, uh, is the sort of cultural, uh, pro more cultural program from um, of first release cinema. So I'm talking about films like the documentary talking about trees from Senegal or So Long My Son, a three-hour um, Chinese uh, drama. Um, the reason these are just not, commercial cinemas don't go anywhere near films like that because it just doesn't make them enough money. The idea being that the subsidy that we get, the public subsidy that we get, and the money that we bring in from the major films I mentioned before um, help subsidize, if you like, the, um, the more uh, interesting, if I can call it that, elements of the program. These films are usually distributed by smaller distributors or kind of what I like to call one man in his bedroom type operations. I say one man in his bedroom because I know them all and they're all men. I, I can't tell you. <laughs> I can't tell you that they do it from their bedroom, but sometimes it appears that they do. <laughs> the other thing is, um, I selected sort of second runs that just maybe weren't, um, you know, worth the full kind of two or three weeks. One thing to say is, by the way, when you show big films like, say, uh, Oppenheimer or Barbie, the distributor will be very clear about how long and for how many shows they want you to play it from, uh, you know, it can go beyond eight weeks sometimes, the demands that they make. Um, so yes, the third sort of part of the program is, is more, it's for me certainly the more interesting part, um, sort of repertory programming, retrospective, thematic programming, sometimes it's created in-house, sometimes it's bought in from another cinema doing the same thing. And they're brought in for sort of reasons of being timely or exciting or rare, or they tie in or contextualize uh, new release cinema. The last part of our program, if I can just do this, um, is third party film festivals. So we, in the old film house, called them program, program partners. Uh, we have this, they have varied in number, probably about 15 of them when, when the place closed, but at its peak, we probably had about 30. And this is where much of the, the sort of diversity and inclusivity in Film House's program resides. Um, not only do these relationships give us shared access to audiences, but um, they bring to us expertise that is not really sustainable to keep uh, inside the organization. Um, some examples, some shining examples of these program partners would be Take One Action, African Motion, Scotland Loves Anime, um, I can say now that uh, the time all all the people who we called who the old film house called program partners will be invited to return to film house as as part of uh, the ongoing um, as, as the new the new film house. It is for us a fundamental programming principle. Um, having said that, it, it's probably when we're kick if and when we get to the point of kicking off new film house. Um, we probably, in the first instance at least, be doing it with significantly less staff than is perhaps entirely comfortable. That's just because we're being cautious about, about um, you know, being sustainable. Jenny mentioned all the kit that we use to service all these festivals and all the extra stuff we would do is all still there, all still works, and will belong to us again. On top of all of this, we do an awful lot did an awful lot of education, and that will be brought into um, the new film house as well. So formal, informal schools, universities, further and continuing education. And I was going to write a bit about what that is, but we got today a message from a teacher, and I thought it spoke more eloquently of what we do than I ever could. If I can just find it in my notes. Yes. Okay. I have personal experience of using the support of the film house to support the learning of primary pupils. The children produce their own information film in French, 
about their school and organize the production and showing of the film in Filmhouse for their parents, staffing it as French ushers, etc. The success of the project was entirely down to the kudos of having the use of a real cinema. Further support was given to me as a teacher to use films with the children to enhance their critical skills and analysis of the messages that lay behind the films. A hugely important skill that would stand them in good stead for the future. The film house must survive. Thank you, whoever that was. And now, to speak about the uh, sort of business planning side of this, James. Hello. Um, hello, I'm James Rice, and I have um, three copies of my notes in case I lose them halfway through. Um, that, that, that's about risk mitigation. Um, uh, I worked at FOMAS in the festival for uh, many years, uh, mainly in program delivery, um, also a bit in business systems. Um, I left in 2019, and for the last few years I've worked at a couple of companies um, that provide uh, support and services and consultancy for independent cinemas um, in the UK and abroad. Um, part of that work is around uh, feasibility assessment, so uh, working with people who want to set up new cinemas to determine whether their plans are financially viable um, and operationally viable. Um, and so that experience has been really helpful um, in the last year or so as I've kind of come back uh, and got involved in trying to help get Filmhouse uh, open again. Um, partly just in terms of uh, getting to know a kind of really diverse, much wider uh, landscape of independent cinema operators independent cinema operations and out. Um, so yeah, so uh, partly that experience of working at these couple of companies where I've been for the last few years has been uh, really helpful in terms of uh, getting to know a much um, wider landscape of independent cinema operations. Um, and also in terms of uh, being able to do this kind of business modeling. So that's one thing I've been leading on um, for Filmhouse is developing the kind of in-depth detailed um, model that lets us uh, try to assess uh, whether and how we can set Filmhouse up um, on a stable footing, on a footing that will be uh, sustainable for the long term um, because obviously that's what we we want that's the only way to think about it um, and, and and so uh, I'm, that's why I'm going to speak about the things from a, more of a kind of business perspective um, and the reason for worrying about this obviously is that in order to deliver the kind of program that Rod has described with all of this tremendous wealth of um, filmmaking uh, coming in front of audiences um, Filmhouse uh, really needs to have that stable uh, business underpinning um, otherwise um, it won't last for the long term Historically, um, as uh, Rod mentioned, and I think Jenny mentioned, um, uh, there's been a, a level of public subsidy that's enabled Filmhouse to um, kind of uh, push beyond what can work in a, in a straightforward commercial environment. Uh, and, and, and historically, as I say, that's been around about 15%, 1-5% of the total um, revenue coming into the, into the business. The other 85% um, has traditionally come from uh, revenue generated through trading, so selling film tickets and selling food and beverage in the cafe bar mainly. Um, and uh, th that's the normal balance. We obviously can't expect more subsidy in future. There very well may be considerably less. Um, so in our planning now, we need to make sure that Filmhouse can generate sufficient um, trading revenue to, um, to be stable. Um, stepping back a bit, I think probably everyone in the room is well aware that the uh, economic conditions at the moment are pretty uh, challenging um, for all sorts of businesses, all sorts of individuals. Um, and the cinema sector has had a, a, a bumpy ride since COVID for sure. Um, so you might say, well, isn't it too risky to open any kind of cinema uh, uh, at the moment? You know, how can Filmhouse survive, not least considering all of the complexities of trying to deliver a program that uh, ranges so widely? Um, and it's true that the, the cinema sector as a whole is still in recovery mode after COVID. Um, and there are, are definitely cinemas out there who are um, uh, under under pressure. Um, pressure because of um, uh, lower revenue in a lot of cases, because attendance is still still recovering um, after COVID. And higher costs, um, energy costs in particular, are, are a big burden at the moment for all kinds of businesses. And cinemas are no exception. Um, and other things as well. But I think that it's um, really important to um, focus not too much on a snapshot of today, but on the trends that we're seeing in the sector. And um, if, if you look at, um, especially around box office and attendance levels in the UK, Every year since COVID, it's gone up and up and up significantly. And, uh, you know, major analysts, so the likes of Gower Street Analytics, uh, Comscore, uh, ad agencies like DCM, whose job it is to understand the cinema market and and work out uh, where things are going, how it's going to perform. Um, th they're all really quite consistently now uh, projecting that um, the, the sector as a whole will hit uh, pre-COVID um, box office levels uh, sometime next year. Um, so that's actually a, a reasonably um, encouraging place to be. Um, 
one of the main factors um, underlying all of this, both the kind of depressed attendance at cinemas everywhere um, in recent years, and also the completion of that recovery process, um, is the a key factor is the availability, the consistent availability of um, of films, films, new films, new release films uh, of the sort that will excite people, that will encourage them to come out of their homes and go to the cinema, um, and that that applies, uh, uh, you know, equally um, at, uh, at for the kind of cultural cinema that Filmhouse will be. Uh, and, and was before, uh, as it does in a mainstream sector. As Rod said, the you know the small number of new release titles brings in um, a very substantial proportion of the revenue that Filmhouse needs in order to continue operating. Um, and uh, and and that pipeline is now recovering because there was a lot of impact by on COVID, not just directly on cinemas, but on film production. And so the, the, the release pipeline has been very sporadic for, for some years as a knock on effect of those production impacts. Um, that's working its way through the system. And thankfully, as of last week, the, um, screen actors and the screenwriters have resolved their, uh, uh their strike with the, uh, with the studios. So, um, from this point on, uh, film production, there's no systemic barrier now to film production getting into full gear. And that should continue to feed through. And, um, and we like, pretty much every other cinema operator or hopeful hope potential cinema operator um in the country and indeed anywhere um is uh hopeful and expecting that that will um lead to a much uh, stabler position um focusing back on film in particular um i just want to reemphasize something that um Ginny said that uh, the thing that collapsed last year was not film house as a standalone uh individual cinema entity it was the larger construct of the cmi um and we really strongly believe and i'm repeating what Ginny said but i think it's worth repeating that um film house as a standalone uh, entity will be much better able to focus on its core mission to take the right decisions for um its audiences uh, and for its business health um as a general general way of thinking Back to the financial model itself, um, there are obviously lots of different inputs that go into that kind of modeling. Um, we've tried to be very cautious, and I think we have been cautious around both revenue and costs uh, in terms of the numbers we plug in there. On the revenue side, for example, we're projecting that Filmhouse's attendance will only hit pre-COVID levels several years after the, the expectation for the sector as a whole. So that's very, very cautious. Um, likewise, on costs, um, energy is a big one. Uh, we are not just allowing for um, the energy costs that we see today in the energy market, which is remains very elevated, um, but allowing for a significant, um, uh, you know, step up above that. Um, we've shared the financial model with um, Screen Scotland, with the City of Edinburgh Council, who then put it out to external review. So it went to a specialist consultant who got their teeth into it. Uh, and the model has passed that scrutiny, um, which gives us um, additional confidence that uh, the, the way we're thinking about actually um, organizing the in internal aspects of the business I'm at a nuts and bolts level the way we're thinking about that is uh, is realistic and um, and uh, and will be viable um, as a new operation um, one important thing to emphasize in that context though and again maybe stepping out and looking thinking about other cinemas and, and how they fare and what we see in the sector more widely the cinemas, especially since COVID, it was true before COVID, but especially since COVID, um, the cinemas that are faring better and dealing better with the difficult conditions um, that, that are affecting affecting them these days are the cinemas that are able to um, offer their customers a, a, a good, comfortable, uh, attractive experience all around the film, end to end. The film is always at the core of any cinema experience, any cinema visit, um, and that's absolutely has to be the case at Filmhouse. We're celebrating, um, you know, uh, brilliant filmmaking from every quarter is just um, uh, uh, just the, the, the core thing. Uh, but really, we do also need to think about how to make the experience attractive um, for people visiting the cinema, because, um, you know, it needs to be a place where people want to spend time before and after the film. That's where great conversations can happen. People meet like-minded people and, and, and can learn from each other. Um, it's also a time when people might buy a coffee or a cake or a pint of beer or a plate of chickpea curry. And, um, and the revenue from all of that um, is uh, just absolutely critical to keeping Filmhouse going. Um, and um, so our financial model assumes that the venue itself does not deter people from attending. And our, our view at the moment, given what the interior is like, um, Ginny was mentioning the fabric on the seats and so forth, um, is that at the moment it is too worn out to be really um, uh, attractive beyond a, perhaps a very dedicated core of people. Um, and, uh, and so that's why we're focusing on, uh, renovation. Um, we, within that, we need to, uh, reseat the cinemas. We think we need, we, we'd love to revitalize the cafe and foyer, um, open it out, make it more comfortable, uh, and just refresh it. Um, there's some loos that probably need to be fixed up, um, and, and various other things. We'd love to do other things like, um, uh, improve accessibility where we can. And we think it might be possible to put a level entry into, um, screen two, which 
which would remove the need for at least one of the platform lifts uh, might be better for um, those who use wheelchairs. Uh, and we're looking at things around energy efficiency as well, um, because energy costs, we're assuming, are going to remain high for a long time. Also, we want to emit less carbon. Um, so alongside the renovation costs, as Jenny said, there are other costs um, around just setting a business up. None of the former business infrastructure, all of the kind of operational things and systems, are in, none of it exists anymore. So we're starting from scratch to set up a new organization and um, that carries some costs. Um, so all of that's rolled into our kind of overall fundraising uh, uh, targets. And I'll hand back to Ginny to talk a bit more about fundraising efforts and what, what happens next. <laughs> We're nearly done. Um, so, um, as you all know, we're engaged in heavily in a fundraising exercise. This is a kind of wide campaign, the focus of which, mostly in the public domain, is the crowdfunder, which is a thing of beauty, in fact. And it's slightly defying the normal patterns, because normally what happens is uh, when, you know, when you start, you have a huge peak of giving, and then it goes into a trough, and then near the end, there's another peak. And we're just amazed because every week it just chugs along and people put in 10 pounds 20 pounds 2000 pounds oh somebody's given us 500 pounds and it and it there's no particular pattern to it so it's fantastic and we've uh made it we've extended it basically um into february which matches our kind of end date sort of i'll explain that but um it's a great thing the crowdfunder and um, it's not sort of coming to an end and we're now proud to see it just runs on and goes on doing what it's meant to do. So um, there's that. And then the crowdfunder caused some people to give us donations direct. So we've got um, a little pot of that. Is it about £35,000? Um, we've obviously got public funding, which is we're very grateful for. Thank you to uh, Screen Scotland. And we were just talking to the City of Edinburgh Council today and they're very positive about giving us some support. Um, and then we will be um, applying for, if we can, we, we're investigating the levelling up uh, programme that is a central government thing that that has been a successful thing for a couple of cultural organisations in the city already. Um, and of course, we are seeking uh, philanthropy, as as it can be called, um, high net worth individuals who have a track record of supporting culture and the arts. So um, we're we're firing on all cylinders here, and that's really where we need your help, um, because after tonight, you're all ambassadors, and um, we 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 suspect that you've probably already contributed. But what's really important at this stage is that. People need to, we've discovered there are some misunderstandings out there still, which is not unsurprising. Um, we're not, as I said at the beginning, we're not doing this for us. We're doing it for everybody that wants Filmhouse back. Um, we're just fortunate enough to have kind of be close enough to it that, that, that we decided to kind of go down this route. Um, it's a charity. And it, its main focus of the charity is education, um, promotion of arts and culture. This is the same as the film house that started in 1979. It's exactly the same set of charitable objects. Um, so that's great. Um, again, we weren't the CMI and we thought that the cinema was viable. You've now heard tons about, you know, how we've kind of got the business angle covered and um, that hopefully would reassure people because there are people who are still doubtful, not clear about what's going on and that was the purpose of this evening apart from anything else um, so we need to break out of the existing we call it a bit of a bunker but it's a huge bunker um, you know our social media is great but we need now to get beyond the group that have given and you become the ambassadors because I know I've still got friends who have not contributed. Now this, in the state the world is in, we understand completely there are other calls on people's uh, money, etc. So we're just talking about people who could and who haven't um, perhaps made that leap yet to um, giving money. Because we do need it um, if we're going to open Film House. I mean there was a great deal of joy um, when it was revealed it was possible. <laughs> Um, but we haven't got the money yet to do it. And that's what this next 
um, the next few months are really going to be concentrated on. Um, so we need people to talk to their friends and say, you know, is there anything you don't quite understand? Are you being cautious for any reason? Because we think you would want to give to this. I mean, I can think of five of my friends right now that I know have not given any money and I'm very surprised. I, I can, what's going on? Why have they not? So, and and it's not about twisting people's arms. It's about the evidence that you think they're interested in cultural and they like cinema. And apart from anything, the film house is a really important cultural institution in the city. Um, to digress just anecdotally, I was uh, in France in January and I went to the town of Cahors, which I later found out had 20,000 people and population. And it's very nice. I parked the car, I got out and there is this temple to cinema in front of me. It's got gold letters saying cinema. It's a new brick building. It's been built specifically. Uh, and it's great. They had the space and everything. But they built this new cinema and they've got 20,000 people. This is an international cultural capital. And at the moment, you can't see the Red Shoes or any of the Powell and Pressburger um, retrospective that the BI5 put together, which is an extensive one. It's not just three films. So you can't see that. You can't see it. Couldn't see Oppenheimer in 70 mil. Sorry, I get really worked up about this. <laughs> um, and we we should really, because um, it's not just for Edinburgh, you know, it's the surrounding area. It's also about championing cinema and film in Scotland. And other people do that as well, but it needs more, you know, needs us all. So um, you're ambassadors and um Please help us raise raise the money we need to to, to open the doors. So, um, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Ginny, and, and thank you all for um, for, for listening to um, the information that was provided to us tonight. As I said at the beginning, we've got um, we wanted to make loads of space for you to ask questions or clarification if there was anything that was mentioned that um, that you wanted to hear more about or that you weren't sure you understood in the way that it was presented. So if you've got questions, now's your chance. Um, if you could raise your hand and I will come to you or maybe I was going to say my colleague David will, but um, yeah, David's got a room. Right, so there's somebody at the back, David, if that's okay, at the very back. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just going to clarify to open the doors. Um, is it 1.25 million we need from all the sources? Yes, I should have made that clear, actually. <laughs> yes, we need 1.25 million, we think, to, to cover all the costs that we have the ambition to cover at the moment. Um, there will come a point where, um, and we've got we've got half a million. Yay. Um, so we need, you know, another 750 if my arithmetic's correct. Um, and um, yeah, so it's to cover everything that we believe we would like to do. And there'll come this point where we've got the costings from the architect and the QS and we know how much money we've got, but we will look at what the priorities are and look at when there is a sort of line where we think, you know, it's not possible to do the right, you know, the right thing by this at all. Um, and then hopefully we'll be over that line because we know that people want the film house to be open. But we have an ideal scenario, which is that it's a really lovely place to go to, that it's a modern cinema experience and that we can attract new audiences because you've got a choice, you know, to go and see a new release. Um, we want people to choose film house to come and see it. And sorry, just just to barge in and qualify that last comment. Um, so so the, the the wish to make it a venue where uh, people want to go and choose to go to Filmhouse when they could see one of these new release tentpole features elsewhere. That's important from an in terms of trying to um, encourage more people to engage with the broader range of things that Filmhouse shows because we want to be able to talk to them. So get new people in for the, the more popular films and then we can talk to them about others. But it's also important in a business sense because as Rod says, um, it's it's a relatively small number of the more popular features that actually keep the entire place afloat. Um, so, and, and that's where just having the venue in a in a more comfortable place is important. I mean, I think we think that 
and we don't want to get too much into too much depth of it. But basically, we absolutely need to reseat Cinema One and Two because they're just you know they're nice red seats in Cinema One, but not very comfortable, and you can't cross your legs and all of the mo- you know things that people expect now. So yes, that's totally on our agenda. Thank you. When we talk about when we talk about the seats, by the way, there really is like a, an, a, a surprising number of them. The stuffing is coming out. The fabric's ripped. You can see that. You can see the structural frame coming out. It's it's not. It's you can't sell a ticket to that. You can't. Yeah. No. Right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. I'll just. David's going to come to you. Thanks. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is. What's the length of the lease that you're discussing with the landlords? And the second question is, are you doing a sort of potential Christmas present type thing that some other charities do where you can give people a donation to the film house for, as a Christmas present? Um, the answer to the first question is a long lease. Uh, we're talking about 20 years to start with, but renewable. So it would be in the um, in in the terms of the lease that it was renewable. Um, there was even talk of forty years, but none of us could conceive of that. <laughs> but that's the ambition. The ambition is is in perpetuity. Filmhouse would exist, so that that's what we hope to build in. Um, who wants to answer the question about Christmas gifts? <laughs> I, I can do that. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, that, that idea, we have considered that idea. And I think that we have put some, um, thoughts out about it on social media, but I don't know how widely that has percolated. Um, the short answer is, uh, yes, but in a fairly informal way, because, um, basically what we've done, I think Rod, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we've just said that if people put the word gift in their comment uh, with our, with our crowdfunding donation, then we will essentially find those when we're go through everything at the end, contact the person who actually actually made the donation and see to it that the uh, like if, the, if if the donation is for one of the rewards on the crowdfunder see to it that the like how to get the reward to the correct person so that's a, a bit informal but we looked at some of the practicalities of doing it otherwise and weren't quite sure how to go about it without taking on a level of admin that we don't actually have the resource to to deal with if anybody has any ideas about how to do that in a more clever way we would be all ears thank you David, there's another question at the back, if you don't mind rushing around. Um, I would like to be able to sponsor a seat. Um, I've been to um, cinemas and theatres where there is a a little plaque put on the back of a chair. Um, Say I donate a £1,000 And in combination with the Edinburgh College of Art, um, there are a few hundred seamstresses out there who can re-upholster the seats. Um, And I choose to have a red one with pop fiction written on it. Um, And each seat is individual. um, And companies, schools, all sorts of organizations might be able to raise a thousand pounds to get their seat. Just an idea I just thought of just now. Um, yes, um, I don't know if you've been on the crowdfunder, but we have a reward, which is if you give us £1,500, you get a seat or you can dedicate a seat to somebody. Um, the idea of the upholstery and the art, art, art aspect of that is really interesting. And I don't know that we would be able to do it in the whole cinema, but that's something we can definitely talk about. Um, because it may be that there's a role that we could have specially done, but, um, at the moment, you can um, you can in fact dedicate a seat on on the crowdfunder if you want, and that might be a, a thing for Christmas, or maybe it's um, you know a, um, in memory of somebody. Um, so yes, that and we'll be doing more of that if we sign the lease. You know, we'll we'll be doing more emphasis on dedication, dedicated seats, but we'll have we'll think about your artistic idea that's really interesting and just just to clarify as well just to add because um if you did want to bring several people together to make a donation to, for that purpose you can also give money outside of the crowdfunder as yeah just several people have done so that that's also a possibility if people wanted to club together from a specific organization or you know several together yeah just get in touch with us i think it's fundraiser fundraising 
at Film oh, House. I better check that. Yeah. Anyway, it's on the crowdfunder. Um, if you, if you, or is it on the Film House website as well? Both, I think. Anyway, we're checking all that, but you can email us. Is what we're trying to see. There's about three hundred email addresses you can get in touch with us. So Thank don't don't worry. Yeah, or talk to us after. Thank Thanks. you. There was. Absolutely. Yeah, another couple of hands. So one over there, and then David, one at the back on the left hand side. My left. Well, something. It's okay. Something that was just said that intrigued me, and I'm wondering if you've done anything on corporate funding for seating, for something like Cinema One, especially, where you could put something up for very large donors who would maybe be up to five or ten thousand pounds for a seat. Yes. Um. At the moment, what we're what we've done with the philanthropists, as it were, um, you know, the, that can cover a huge range from, um, I don't know, what, <laughs> it can be, you know, they might want to give us half a million pounds, please, but um, it could be 50,000, it could be 10,000. So we have something that, that they could hook into. In, in our in our correspondence with people like that, we've just done done one of those, and and we've itemised, you know, the cost of certain things, and said, you know, this is a menu, um, and in the terms of the corporate side, that that is something that we were going to tackle specifically, if when when we sign the lease, because then we can, um, it's much easier to promise and to fulfil those promises when we know that we're actually going to open the cinema. Um, at the moment, it's it's a bit more complicated to get involved in a corporate relationship with people when it's a bit iffy. I'm not sure how keen they'd be on that. But we've definitely got that in mind. <laughs> yeah. We'd love that. J yeah. James, James was raising his hand as well, yeah. James was raising his hand. I, I was going to say that um, in in the mix, uh, 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 just following on what Jenny said, we have had actually um, one uh, local company uh, just come forward voluntarily and make a make a significant donation um, outside the crowdfunder. So um, there is scope for it. But <laughs> hi, yes, you've waited patiently, and then there's another question after that. Go ahead. So yeah, I, <clears throat> this is not a question. I just want to thank you, Jenny, and your four the gang of four, for what you're doing, because it's a huge job and a huge task. And we are all really grateful. And I'm a very happy ambassador. And I'm going to go out and do the best I can to make to open the doors. So thank you very much. Is a question just here? Okay. So, uh, can I just quickly quickly respond to that? Uh, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, um, th so firstly, th thank you very much. That's that's really kind. Um, I, I guess personally, I would just want to uh, emphasize that um, while we four have been doing a lot of work, um, it's by no means just us. There's been an awful lot of work uh, by other people, um, both in, in terms of organizing grassroots support, in terms of people contributing on the crowdfunder, um, tremendous work from Screen Scotland, people at the City of Edinburgh Council. Um, so uh, it, it, it's, it's a much wider team and um, I really appreciate your comments, but I, uh, that's important to emphasize as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I think, um, yeah, what's interesting about, I mean, you understand it, that's why this is what's important for ambassadors because just to see how you feel because, I mean, I was praying someone would do something about <laughs> when it all went off. I went, oh, please, you know, somebody do something. And then after it was the building was sold, I had that creeping feeling of horror that Film House was not going to be there. And it took a while, but it was a creeping feeling of horror. And that's really what drives a lot of us, including all the people that are helping us and people that have given. I mean, if you want to have a cry about the emotion behind all of this and the love of film in general, read the comments on the crowdfunder. There are now 700 of them and it is incredibly moving. Well, we find them. Any, thank you, Ginny. I think what would be great would be to move from that sense of horror towards that sense of um, active hope towards what can be achieved if we do come together and if we do manage to get more people involved in supporting the fundraiser. But also I, I want to echo the thanks uh, to you all for the work that you've been doing. I also want to echo what Jim said about the, the, the grassroots support that's been um, that's been carried through the last 13 months um, and your presence tonight is testament to that as well. Um, but yeah, I would love for us to, rather than 
dread the horror of film house not being there really start making it very tangible that it will come back um yeah <laughs> go ahead I'm just really echoing what this lady said here. I worked at Film House for, for many years. I know the four people that are speaking to us tonight and they're all exceptional people. And, um, I, I just, I, I agree entirely with what you said. You know, thank you for doing what you're doing. Just being here tonight, listening to you talking about Film House, you know, Film House has always been held together by people who are really passionate in what it does from a programming point of view, from an educational point of view, and from a community point of view. That building falling apart as it may have been was held together by ushers who would stay at night and sew together the fabric on the seats to keep the seats together. You know, it was... It, it was full of people who would come on their own with friends to see films, would talk to you, would talk to me, um, would talk to the staff. Um, it was it was a place in the city that was safe for so many people and a, an inspiring place for so many people. And, you know, good for you and well done that you are trying to keep that flame burning and, and thank you for doing that. And, you know, I'm really proud of the four of you so and everyone else behind the scenes. And I know that there is so. I Thank can, you. I can see the faces of some of those seamstresses uh, and seamsters <laughs> in the room. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, do we have any other questions? About, um, go ahead. And then just a reminder as well that uh, if you would like to move beyond what was already talked about earlier, and if you've got more general questions that you would like to um, to ask within this forum, there is uh, ample time for us to do so too. Go ahead. Am I right in thinking that you're planning to have three screens? So the question was, am I right in thinking that you're planning to have three cinemas? Three screens. Three screens, yeah. Three cinemas, three screens. Yes, the same. And if we get enough money, we and more than our wildest dreams, uh, we would like to look at creating us a fourth screening room so that um, that would help our business model. And it's not quite a cinema, but available for, you know, private hire or whatever. So that's on the cards as well. Um, and j just to broaden out, I guess, in the response there, uh, when we talk about the renovation, um, by and large, we don't have in mind things which involve significant structural change to the, it's not like ripping everything out and, and putting in new walls and all that. It's more about, um, fittings and, and decoration and, and the kind of just, uh, and, you know, furniture and things like that. So, so bringing it more up to a better standard, but not totally changing what, you know, what the screens are, or what the interior is. Does anyone want to talk about the cafe bar? Because we're very interested in, I mean, you know, we make jokes about, will we keep the chickpea curry? Um, yay. <laughs> Lots of people nodding. <laughs> but I think that, yeah, because it's something that's quite a tricky thing in this current climate. The catering world is in disarray. Not a question, but just an endorsement of the cafe bar. The Filmhouse <laughs> Cafe Bar was central um it was so easy not only if you were meeting before a film which if we were we would always meet an hour ahead of time so we could enjoy but we used it for so many other purposes if we were going to the usher hall we would meet in the film house if we're going to the king's theater we meet in the film house you were the best place for hot vegetarian food in the city centre and we miss your spicy bean that shows um so many friends if they were visiting the city i would act as tour guide and we would finish at the film house because we knew we could always get a seat and food so yes we want the cafe bar back and your tray bakes and your carrot cake <laughs> 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 Thank you. I think it's uh, it's interesting. There was a report that came out today that was commissioned by the BFI on the cultural value of the cultural and financial value of cinemas and their value to communities, and the the value of a cinema when it has a social hub like a cafe bar uh, is exponentially larger to to the community surrounding it, and the importance of having those spaces for people to congregate is well. I mean, 
I don't know about you, but when you try and meet someone near Lothian Road these days, it's a bit difficult. And I'm still in mind in mindset of oh, let's meet at some. Oh, no, we can't. So yeah, I totally echo that too. Um, that the importance of that space for people to congregate, to speak about the films they've seen, but also maybe just to chat and not even go to the cinema sometimes, but still have a space to meet was was tremendous, definitely. Um, do we have other questions? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, we'll start over there, and then we move to Brian, and then. We'll go to back. Go ahead. Hiya. Um, I was just wondering what the relationship with the film festival would be moving forward. Thank you. Is we that... want them back. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've just announced a new uh, director today as well. Um, but the, the, the two organisations will be separate. Is that, that for the moment, your plans are to keep Film House as a cinema. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. So at, at, at the kind of... Um, company structure le legal entity structure they'll be separate entities um operating uh, uh you, you know under their own governance structures and so forth um and that then because to do it otherwise that would be more like making the cmi um which we don't really want to do um but the but I, but I mean my own personal view on that is having worked for a long time on both the film festival and film house um uh including concurrently is that they are kind of innately there, there, there will be a symbiotic relationship. There kind of has to be because the missions are so closely aligned, and um, the facility that FOMAS has and the skills base that FOMAS maintains year-round is something that I think will be um, of interest and of value to the film festival, um, not just as a venue, but uh, for other kinds of support as well. So, for our part, we 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 want to, uh, you know, um, renew or start up a new, renew the old relationship with the film festival. Um, but more like it was before they were uh, conjoined into a single legal entity. Which was up until 2009, yeah. is that correct? 2010, yeah. I think something that's really interesting about that, having worked at the film festival for 15 years and then also been involved with the film house, and people say to me, oh, why? I've made Sophie's choice. Um, in the sense that the film house is so important to be there year round and to do exactly what James was saying about supporting other festivals, but particularly... Uh, the International Festival, Film Festival, um, which I've always had a bit of a joke that I see them as the glamorous cousin that comes back to town in the summer with their fancy car and their shades and their, hi there, how are you? And, you know, we're the guys that are digging the soil all year. But that's, um, both of these things are needed and and uh, they are, you know, they're linked. And um, yeah, we definitely would want that relationship back. Thank you. Um, Brian, you had a question? Um, uh, Brian has a question here, David? Uh, no. Oh, not that, Brian. Next one. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask about the Film Guild, um, which was quite a central part to the Film House for many, 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 many years. Um, I know they had, or it seems like they had a bit of money that came from the sale. Will that money be going back into the film house? Is that going to be a completely separate thing and they're going to be setting up somewhere else? Or are we or is that going to be part of the pot in some way? Um the film guild um uh when the film house shut, they had to find other arrangements. And they did. And they seem to be very happy with those arrangements. That's what we've heard. So um at the moment, we, we are, they are, they are not there, as it were. They're not in the film house situation. But, um, we always remember, you know, that, that they're the mothership, as we used to call them. Um, but times move on. Things change. Circumstances change. They seem to be quite happy with, I mean, their, their situation at the moment. They don't need, they just need screening spaces specifically. So. Thank you. Um, there was a question from Brian. Just here. <laughs> Hi, Jenny. You mentioned earlier the backing, but that crucial intervention from the councillors on the license issue being a pivotal moment. And you, you were saying a little bit about the discussions you've been having um, with the council. Can you tell us a little bit more about those discussions in particular? A little bit more about, I suppose, what you're asking them to do to make this happen, because um, obviously they there was money and there may well still be money in the council's budget to support the film house, as there was previously. 
Um, and I mean, are you just really trying to say to them, can you at least give us what Screen Scotland have committed, or are you looking for a bit more from them in terms of a kind of longer term commitment, as you'll need, obviously? And well, also in terms of the UK government, I just wonder what if you tell us. I mean, again, are you, even in the short term, are you saying to them? Because obviously, the big thing that happened earlier this year was the the campaign to refurbish the King's Theatre got to the point where they had to go public and say to everyone, you've got 35 days to save this place or we're going to hand the keys back to the council. I just wonder if you might get to that point <laughs> that they did in, in January or February. I hope not. Um, good set of questions there, Brian. Um, <laughs> so um, I'll start, I suppose. Um well, as everybody knows, the council is strapped for cash. Um, and we're, we have spoken to, we, we have now got, I would say, a very productive relationship with the city council because one of the things that was achieved earlier on was that when we were talking to, um, the culture and communities committee, uh, the politicians, as it were, they were, they were actually very supportive. And, um, things take quite a while in the council to, you know, un, I don't know what you call it, progress. Um, so we are talking to them about what they can do for us. And it's, yeah, it's quite positive. But of course, we have also, we're applying for funding in the normal way as if we were going to open. So, you know, it's it's quite interesting because of course we've had to put in a multi-year funding application for <laughs> for the possibility that film houses open in 2025. Um, before that, but in 2025, because all of these things are done in advance. So we are we are talking to the council about next financial year. Um, as usual, they would be probably supporting um, an education post or something similar, as it has always been. So I would say we have positive relationship with the council and they do what they can. Does that answer any of your questions? Mm. <laughs> well, I mean... There was money in the budget. <coughs> there was money in the budget before. <coughs> I can't imagine that, but budgets just vanished into thin air with the collapse of the CMI. What what did they do with that money that was well, committed I think to the CMI? You'd have to ask them what they've done with it. But we are That's talking it. to them about some of that money, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. I know they're strapped for cash, but they do commit millions of pounds to support no, we are, we are, culture we're having, every year. We're having positive conversations with the council about, about some of that funding, yeah. Thank you, Ginny. Now, um, I would like to move on to the next uh, section, um, but before I do so, I, I wanted to just bring up a few of the questions that were shared online, if that's okay, by people who sent questions in advance. Um, I'm going to summarize them, but there was a question on the commitment to bringing back inclusive and accessible screenings at Film House. Um, someone who used to come with a child and said they really miss it because it's quite hard for them to have access to accessible screenings. Um, that's a question maybe for Rod, if you can answer that. Uh, it's very easy to answer. Uh, yes. <laughs> in a short, in short, yes. Uh, you know, we um, we've uh, it's in a it's in a successful funding application. So yes, I think we'll be doing it. Absolute commitment to that. Okay, thank you, Rod. Um, there was a question around the archive of um, Film House and EIFF. Um, and its archive of events, specifically and interviews, and whether that's still accessible and whether it's been kept safe. Yeah, that that question came in, um, and it, yeah, around because there was a lot of um, historical material um, housed in Filmhouse. Some of it relating to past events and happenings at Filmhouse or the Filmhouse program itself. Some of it, a lot of it relating to the film festival's uh, history, and that included um, uh, a lot of uh, videotape material or, or, or recordings of live events. Um, some with um, uh, exceptional filmmakers you've never heard of. Some with uh, people whose names we would all know. Um, so it's a really interesting and important archive. The answer to, about the video material is I don't actually know unless Emma, you, you don't know. We don't know yet. However, um, what happened uh, very shortly, very quickly actually after um, the place shut was that through means I'm not, I don't fully understand, uh, the National Library of Scotland 
was allowed to go into the building and uh, and collect materials that they consider to be of archival importance. Um, so there is now a collection of that material um, at the National Library, um, and um, I, I, we're in contact with them uh, finally, and uh, they haven't yet catalogued it, so it's not entirely clear what's included there. Um, but uh, um, we're, we're going to try to work with them to find out more about it and, uh, and see what's there. Um, there's still some material of archival interest uh, in the building, and whenever I find anything like that, I've been trying to collect it into one very quiet, uh, very dark room where uh, nothing will happen to it. Um, and uh, I believe there was also, Emma, there was some material that that you guys took for EIFF as well, was there? Yeah, which is in storage at uh, EIFF, in storage at the moment. Okay, so um, so the film festival also had an opportunity to go in and collect some materials that were specific, EIFF specific, um, and those are held in storage at EIFF. Yeah, yeah. So he, he, here, yeah. Festival, yeah. No. In oh. their in their storage. Oh, in their storage in 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 the the storage place. Thank you. Um, it's just all one, safe. <laughs> um, yeah. Just one last question, uh, or maybe a request um, from a twenty four year old living in Leith who came to Femme House as a student um, when uh, they moved here. He said that they they want to make sure that Femme House engages as much as possible with young people. Uh, and encourages their patronage, that they used to have the 16 to 25 year old um, membership, which they found fantastic, which made it very accessible and uh, financially for them to come to film house to watch films, um, but wanted to make sure that for future generation of uh, film lovers and to not sure that future generation as well, that it would be great to make sure that Film House was able to um, attract students, uh, attract young people of all backgrounds, not just students or middle class young people. Um, so a request to to improve or maybe Im enhance on the work that you yeah, already do. The, the, you know, the, the future depends on us being able to um, get young people into the building. I, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the old Film House did the best imaginal imagine job of uh, of doing that and it's it's very much part of um how we see things going at this point in time that um that becomes very much part of a sort of main focus of of marketing the place thank you i think i think there was a, a lack of understanding perhaps of, of all the ticketing offers that film house did make available to uh, to its patrons and the fact that yeah, there was i think there's there's some simplification perhaps required um <laughs> But we're 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 very aware of this. So thank you so much for your time tonight, and I hope to see you all in Film House One in twenty twenty four.